Today is Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024. Colonel Douglas McGregor joins us now. Colonel, it's a pleasure, my dear friend. Welcome back to the show and thank you for your time. There's a lot that I want to ask you about. I'd like to start with relatively uh, breaking news, maybe 36 hours old, and that is the Israeli assault on and destruction of a consulate adjacent to an embassy of Iran in Damascus, Syria. Uh, the motivation behind it and your view of the likely uh, response to it. So the Israelis have not claimed credit for it, but all uh, indications are that they did this. Why would they do something like this? Uh, Mr. Netanyahu must escalate to survive. And he believes that escalating the war is ultimately Israel's salvation. I don't share that view, but that's his opinion. He probably also sees it as his personal salvation. How do you escalate the war? You goad Iran into attacking you. And this is a direct provocation designed to precipitate a, a major response from Iran. If Iran cannot be dragged into this war, then it is very unlikely that Mr. Netanyahu will be able to drag us into his war on his side. So simply put, why would you attack uh, the sovereign territory, which is what a consulate or embassy is, as you know, of Iran? You want Iran to attack you so that you can precipitate a war that will involve the United States against Iran on your side. If... Um... If the uh, mullahs do nothing, if they exercise Putin-like uh, restraint, what do you expect Netanyahu to do? R ratchet up the attacks on Iran to do everything he can to goad them? Yes, I, I would think so. I mean, th there's no alternative for him. Uh, he knows that he's got to attack Hezbollah, and that's a foregone conclusion. It's just a question of when. So he's got to, he's got to drag in Iran into this mess a, as he sees it. Now, what he's not paying attention to is the coalescing of the rest of the region against him. He's not paying much attention to what's going on up in Turkey, for instance. The Turkish population is enraged at Israel. And the Turkish population just rejected Erdogan at the polls. Now, there were several reasons for that, but one of them was Erdogan's continuous uh, provision of oil and food and other things to the Israelis, despite all of his tough talk. And the, the Turks really want to go after the Israelis. They want action against them. And the Arabs are looking at the, at the Turks as their leaders because they are the one Sunni Muslim power with real military capability that could defeat Israel because they know that the neighbors cannot. If um, <clears throat> Iran attacks Israel, if Iran engages in a war for Israel, that's not a pinprick <clears throat> tit for tat, but a serious war. Wouldn't you expect Russia to come to uh, Iran's side? And wouldn't this effectively, thank you, Prime Minister Netanyahu, commence a regional war, almost World War III? Well, I think that's true. And you know, I've been saying that for a long time, and people don't seem to don't seem to understand or grasp it. You have the failed war in, that Washington's been waging in Ukraine. Ukraine is destroyed. And we continue to provoke Russia at every opportunity. I think they're talking about stealing $300 billion uh, Russian funds and turning this over to the Ukrainians. The fools on the hill want to do this. Th this kind of behavior makes it inevitable that if we become involved in a conflict with Iran, that the Russians will come to the aid of Iran. There's no question about it. They, they've deployed forces down into the Red Sea. Their submarines are already in the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea. And they have forces in the Mediterranean. So it's a foregone conclusion that if, if Mr. Netanyahu is successful and we, we are dragged into this, we will end up fighting with the Russians directly. Talk to me about the rage that you mentioned a few minutes ago, <clears throat> Colonel. Is it of such a magnitude that leaders in the area, uh, Turkey, Iran, Jordan, may feel pressured into doing something lest uh, something happen against their will. Oh, absolutely. This is already true in Egypt and Jordan. Uh, these, and, and I would argue Saudi Arabia, the Emirates are all under pressure. The elites in the region are under tremendous pressure. And if they don't act, they all stand an excellent chance of going away. 
Uh, General Sisi has tried, as, as many others, to be on both sides of the fence. On the one hand, he's tried to speak out against what the Israelis are doing, but he's had to renegotiate his enormous national sovereign debt. He's needed our support for that. He wants to keep the United States on side. How much longer that goes on is hard to tell because the Russians and the Chinese may well step in and offer to help him, which would then grant him some freedom of maneuver vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Uh, then you have the Jordanians, and the Jordanian king is hanging on, I think, by his fingernails. He's a very competent man. He's a brilliant leader. He has negotiated the troubled waters of the region with great alacrity. I, d I don't think he wants in any way, shape, or form to be at war with Israel. But he has over a million uh, you know, in, in, enraged Palestinians who want to attack Israel. And I don't think he's going to have much, uh, much longer to to stave it off. I, I think he's in a very, very sensitive position. Everybody uh, comments about how lawless, but also how smart uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is. He's a survivor. How dumb was it for the Israelis to follow for an hour and a half uh, a truck with food workers and then to use three missiles to kill seven people, including an American in that truck? Talk about enraging the public that's resonating even over here colonel well this is one of the one of the things that reached the american people and the american people were disturbed by it but this is not new the, these instances of uh, uh, operators of unmanned aerial systems tracking and then killing people who frankly were simply in the open had nothing to do with uh, the enemy per se hamas or anything else uh, are frequent these things have happened very frequently, and I think it's becoming increasingly clear that this is a, an exercise in uh, casual murder at the whim of the Israelis and the Israeli leadership. Remember, they made it very clear from the beginning that Gaza is full of enemies. If you're in Gaza, you're probably an enemy. They're not going to stop their soldiers from killing anyone, and they're certainly not going to stop the Air Force or the operators of these unmanned systems from killing anyone. Here's a, uh, a cut from uh, an Australian uh, television station lamenting, and including a clip from uh, Prime Minister Albanese of uh, Australia, um, lamenting the, uh, the death, the murder, of one of those seven food workers. A direct hit from a targeted drone strike straight through the charity logo that was meant to ensure those inside were protected from harm. Three vehicles, seven aid workers obliterated, among them Australian Zombie Frankham. Hey, this is Zombie from World Central Kitchen. The 43-year-old's death now the centre of a new diplomatic war with Israel. This is completely unacceptable. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese in a 20-minute early morning call with his Israeli counterpart. I expressed uh, Australia's anger and concern at the death of Zomi Frankom. The killing summed up in two words by Foreign Minister Penny Wong. Outrageous and they are unacceptable. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu admits Israeli defence forces were responsible but claims it was unintentional. This happens in wartime. We are thoroughly looking into it and will do everything to ensure it does not happen again. Three of the victims were from the UK, one a joint US-Canadian citizen, another from Poland and a Palestinian local driver. He was buried overnight. <laughs> The missiles were launched from a Hermes 450 drone. The Israeli military telling local media they believed an armed Hamas terror suspect was with the aid workers at the time. The convoy was hit as it left the charity's warehouse in Deir al-Bala after collecting more than 100 tonnes of food aid delivered to Gaza by sea. Three precision strikes over a two-and-a-half-kilometre stretch as they tried to outrun the drone. The IDF's... No way this was a mistake, uh, Colonel, no matter what Netanyahu says. Nobody believes him anyway. Nobody in the West. Well, I shouldn't say nobody in the West. Biden and that crowd uh, believe him. Admiral Kirby believes him. They continue to justify uh, what he does. Who challenges Netanyahu in the West besides people like Dennis Kucinich and, and you and Scott Ritter and, and me? 
Well, there's nothing more reliable than a man that can be bought with cold, hard cash, right? And people need to understand that that's the case in Washington. Most of your political uh, class is bought and paid for by the Israeli lobby. They're not going to jeopardize their positions, their income, their access uh, under any circumstances. The, the other point I would make here, though, that, that Americans don't seem to understand, I don't think a lot of people do, he, he called it a war zone. Well, it is, but it isn't. It is and it isn't. First of all, Hamas does not have an integrated air defense system. Hamas is uh, organized, and they're obviously tenacious fighters, but they're not an army. Uh, they have rockets, and they use them, and they fire them when they can, but uh, it's a minimum of uh, fire support. And finally, they don't have any naval forces. So you're, you're dealing with essentially guerrillas that, yes, they do swim uh, inside the population, but normally we don't annihilate the entire population on the grounds that it contains a few a few uh, guerrillas. That's collective punishment. We don't engage in that kind of thing. The, the bottom line is that this fog of war argument, it wasn't clear. We didn't know. I don't think that's, I don't think that's legitimate in this sense at all. Certainly not in this case. Remember, the Israeli troops opened fire on uh, some of their own people who had actually escaped custody and were trying to reach them. This was uh, very early in the in this entire war. And they were very trigger happy and they killed their own people. It was only when they finally got close enough to see who they were, they realized they'd killed Israelis. So this is a, a sort of a free fire zone in the worst sense of the word. It reminds me a lot of Vietnam and some of the things that we did there. Colonel, when um, Netanyahu says, and he says it repeatedly, uh, that he wants to eliminate Hamas, he said recently he thinks it can be done in a couple of weeks. Isn't Hamas an idea? Isn't it impossible for him to eliminate Hamas? Well, I, you know, I made that comment early on that uh, killing an idea is much more difficult than killing people. But what this campaign has done is elevated Hamas to a level of notoriety and celebrity that it would never have otherwise had. And that's one of the reasons that I think Netanyahu, in his anger, along with the Israeli public, has said, well, then they all must pay for this. Let the only solution is the final solution. Eradicate this population once and for all. Hatred has taken over. Emotion has taken over. There is no rational calculus unless you want to judge plans for the annihilation of Arabs in Gaza, in the West Bank, and potentially southern Lebanon as a rational calculus. I think that's simply where we are. By the way, to get back briefly to the Iranians, I think it's important to understand that over the last five or six weeks, we've heard nothing out of these so-called Iraqi and Syrian Shiite militias. They've gone quiet. They had been attacking us. I think now after this uh, strike on the consulate, we're likely to see them stir once again and begin attacking us as well as the Israelis if they can do it. Do you think the uh, Iranian government has restrained them? Yes, I think the Iranian government pleaded with them to back off. And unlike the Houthis who are far more independent and autonomous, uh, the Iraqi Shiite militias heeded the, heeded the call for restraint. I think that restraint will now end and they'll probably work very, very hard to attack us and, as I said, the Israelis in whatever way they can. I don't think you're going to see a deliberate counterstrike from Iranian soil because, again, the Iranians don't want a war. This is the thing that, that has to be understood. Nobody in the region except the Israelis and the United States are enthusiastic about the war. If, if the Iranians give Netanyahu his war, how powerful is the Iranian military and how uh, modern is its arsenal of offensive weaponry? Well, remember, the, the Iranian army, the ground force, is very small. Uh, and the Republican uh, or Revolutionary Guard Corps is really a, a special operations and special forces element. They go out and work with the various Shiite groups and organizations. They've helped to train and equip uh, these Shiite militias, but they're not really capable of taking the field uh, against the Israeli Defense Force. And frankly, it's too far away. You, they don't have the logistical infrastructure to sustain anything. 
Iran's trump card is this arsenal of rockets and missiles, primarily theater and tactical ballistic missiles, but also cruise missiles. And they can reach virtually any target inside Israel. And if they were to attack, I think they would unleash everything. Because once you begin trading missile strikes, restraint doesn't make any sense. You end up in a position where you either use it or you lose it. And why would the Iranians wait around for the United States Air Force and the U.S. Naval Air to attack them and essentially put their arsenal at risk? If they're compelled to fight, I think they would probably launch massive, massive strikes. Now, the other thing is that they're they're well prepared. They have dispersed a lot of their capabilities. They have dispersed command and control. Even if we destroy much of the command and control, it will still persist. It's very redundant. And so I think it could turn into a long war. The, the people, of course, who will suffer most are the Israelis at home and the Iranians inside Iran, because Iran's a desert country. I'm sure they will attack water supplies, water purification plants, water distribution points, energy distribution, this sort of thing. Uh, and that will have a catastrophic effect on the Iranian populace. That's something the Iranian leadership doesn't want. And as a result, they've been very careful at this point to restrain their own forces from attacking. But, you know, that, that could end quickly, depending upon next moves by Israel.